Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Oneness in Christ. This is lesson number five in that series for November 3 of 2018, entitled The Experience of Unity in the Early Church. Now you could guess from the title of the series plus the title of this lesson, we're going to be focusing on the idea of unity. We hope that you have your Bible handy. We'll be looking at a lot of passages in the book of Acts and a few others elsewhere. But we always begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we recognize your presence with us each time we open scriptures. And we thank you for it so much. Now as we look back once again at the events that took place just almost immediately after your crucifixion and resurrection, we see that some marvelous changes took place among your followers. May we experience those kinds of changes in our times today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Unity between human beings usually happens because we have shared experiences. That seems to be the common factor. Um, we don't feel so close to the people that don't speak our language, that don't have our culture, that don't whatever. But we're close to the people who are with us all the time, who know our experiences, who travel with us, who speak our language, are from our culture. Maybe they grew up in the same town we did, or especially grew up in the same home that we did. So those are the kind of joint experiences that we have. In the case of Christian, or the church, unity comes because of shared experiences, shared beliefs, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told us in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if we all have to come to the Father through the Son, that would be a shared experience, right? As we will see, the early church was drawn together by their relationship with Jesus Christ. Early Adventists had a similar experience up to the 1844, up until 1844. Um, I hope that you're somewhat familiar with that story. Uh, William Miller um, began preaching somewhere around 1819, and the excitement got more and more, and there were other people, some in Europe, some in South America, other parts of the world, that were excited about the possibility that, hey, it looks like the signs that the Bible has predicted are being fulfilled in our day, and they settle on a, a date of October 22, 1844, as the day to which Jesus would return to this earth. Well, it turned out, uh, as we now know, there was a great disappointment. And after they studied the passages a little closely, they, more closely, they recognized that at that point, Jesus was a, approaching his Father in heaven, as presented in Daniel 7, not coming to this earth. Well, eventually that led to the formation of those people working together, led to the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the year 1863. Think about those first, that first group of disciples. How did they happen to come together? Jesus called them. Okay, called them from where? Did he go around, I want you from over here? And, you from over there and somebody else from back here? Huh? Initially, in terms of the disciples, it was much like that, you know. He went, you know, after the baptism of, uh, by John, then some of mm -hmm. John's disciples came and they went and got some others. Andrew got Peter and so forth and so on. And then he called Matthew and he called, you know, there was some of that. Okay, well, it turns out, if you look at the history very briefly, I'm not going to cover a lot of it, he got two or three disciples that came to him. He didn't call them, they came to him around AD 27 in the fall. A year and a half went by. During that time, sometimes they were with him, many times they weren't with him. He traveled around Judea spreading the gospel. Finally, uh, John the Baptist was arrested. Another Passover, well, two Passovers had taken place by that time. And Jesus said, it's, things are getting difficult here, it's time to move on. He moved to Galilee, and then he began lining up his, his disciples. And it was on one particular time, um, he, he prayed all night, 
according to Luke 6, verse 2, I believe it is. And the next morning he said, I want you and you and you. And they were all there. So the question is, how do they all happen to get there? Including Judas, who Jesus never called. But they were there. Was it just excitement because Jesus was preaching and teaching? Or how do they all happen to end up at that spot? Well, we know there were a diverse bunch of people. A lot of them were fishermen. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector, collecting taxes for Herod, and who passed along a, a lot of money to the Roman government. Uh, Simon, the patriot, um, he was as opposed to the Roman government as you possibly could be, and yet somehow or other these people came together. And what was the secret? Well, there's no other explanation you can give except that they had spent time with Jesus. And that seems to be uh, what seemed to be the key. And, and when it finally gelled, nothing could break that fellowship. Well, Jesus knew as he approached crucifixion weekend that they were going to be, there was going to be, they were going to be severely tried because of the events of which were coming up. And so he promised them on that Thursday evening a comforter that would come to be with them, a comforter just like himself, the, the Greek says. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit would guide them into some incredible experiences, including further truths. More than that, they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came down upon them, if you read in Acts 1, verses 5 and 8. So if you had been given that kind of a promise, I mean, imagine they didn't recognize it yet at that point, but if, you, if we now know that that was God himself in the form of Jesus as a human being making those kinds of promises to them, how would you respond? To the extent that you trusted him, you would, you would follow him. Uh, and uh, It'd be of pretty awesome, huh? They had some mission, some perversions in their head about what his mission was going to be, of course. Yes. So yes. how would they know what, he, what in the world he was talking about? Because we know yeah. by reading all yeah. kinds of old um, New Testament stuff, we know from Paul and all this stuff, yeah. but given the information that he gave to that, them, that's the how question. do you know? How do they knew, know what he was talking about? Well, they obviously, I mean, he didn't stand up on, at the beginning of his Galilean ministry and said, I want to choose 12 people to be future martyrs. I mean, that wasn't part of <laughs> what he disclosed to them. Uh, but based on what we know that they might have known at that point in time. If they had known at the beginning mm -hmm. how it was all going to shake out, could they have borne it? Yeah. And and going letting it all build and build and build and build and then being crushed and starting over on a new slate. Mhm. Mm well, even at the end he told them that I have many things to tell you but you yeah. cannot bear them now. No. So there's yeah. a there has to be a progressive on what, What's the proof of that statement? He told them repeatedly what was going to happen to him <laughs> and they they just didn't get it. Went over their head. Because they their heart was set on something else. Yeah, couldn't you couldn't you initially say that what drew them to him was so different and without all the garbage that the high priests were putting out? Uh, you, when you read the history of it, they yes. were getting tired of that. Yeah, he was so different that I think that's probably what caught their attention. Yeah, and John's uh, disciples had John's testimony that this is this is the one. Right. So they were from the big be beginning to say this was uh, the and Messiah. And uh, remember Matthew 16. Peter just says, "You are Christ, the Son of the Living God." I mean, you know, that's somehow or other that, those words came out of his mouth. I don't know how much he comprehended of all that. But, Gary, I think you have some words about that in Acts 1, 12 to 14. Yes. Then the apostles went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is about a kilometer away from the city. They entered the city and went up to the room where they were staying, Peter, John, James, and Andrew, 
Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, Simon the Patriot, and Judas son of James. They gathered frequently to pray as a group, together with the women and with Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And that comes from the Good News translation from American Bible Society. So, from the time that Jesus ascended, which is just before that passage you, you just read, until the actual um, Pentecost was about 10 or 11 days, something like that. And what are they doing during that time? So first of all, what were they doing during the 40 days? Well, we know, we know about two or three things. We know they, that at least seven of them traveled to Galilee. We know that Jesus met them on a mountainside somewhere in Galilee with about 500 other people. We know that a few days later, um, Jesus met them on the seashore. Or we don't know exactly the time period, but a little while later, Jesus met the, the disciples on the seashore and he said, you know, I, I, li I like some fish. And they said, well, we, we, we fished all night and we didn't get any. He said, well, try, you know, and pretty soon their the nets are so full they don't know, can't hardly pull them in. And they brought him in some. And there he went, he prepared some food for them. And the next thing we know is they're back in Jerusalem, um, ready to. And then the ascension. Do, and we don't, know, we don't know exactly at what point he met them back in Jerusalem, and then there, the ascension. That's what had happened so far. And then they... The ascension was 40 days after, the res after Passover? Yes. Okay. Also in the 40 days, we learned later that he appeared to James, and I think Peter yes. also. Yes. But That's those correct. aren't recorded. Uh, yeah, and that probably happened fairly quickly, near the beginning of the 40 days. So. So, and then in the 10 days after the resurrection, your question was, what, are, what were they doing? Well, the 10 days after the ascension. I'm sorry, after the ascension, before. Yeah, well, what were Pentecost. they doing? Yeah. So, the Bible suggests they weren't they fishing. Were, yeah, Bible suggests they were. They weren't collecting taxes, you know. They were sitting together and they said, you know, what, what, would, what would you do? What would you say if you had some time, maybe 10 days, and you're thinking back of everything that happened in the life of Jesus? and the, everything you'd observed, and you'd be sitting down, what would you say? Well, it says that the Holy Spirit brought to their minds all the things <clears throat> that he had said, and they began to understand what he had meant by what he said, and things became more clear to them. You mean the light came on? Yeah, the, the proverbial light bulb, <laughs> yes. Well, one I, thing I, I think they would be thinking about is the prophecies as they understood it. He was supposed to become a king and mm -hmm. then and then take over everything and then it, that didn't happen. Things they, hadn't they worked out died. quite like that. Huh? Yeah, so now there has to be some change in their outlook. The or just got turned upside down. Yeah, yeah. and so th that might have been opening up the slate right there exactly. for all kinds of things. Jackie, well, I think you have some words on that. Oh. As the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. As they called to remembrance the words that Christ had spoken to them before his death, they understood more fully their meaning. Truths which had passed from their memory were again brought to their minds, and these they repeated to one another. They reproached themselves for their misapprehension of the Savior. Like a procession, scene after scene of his wonderful life passed before them. As they meditated upon his pure, holy life, they felt that no toil would be too hard, no sacrifice too great, if only they could bear witness in their lives to the loveliness of Christ's character. Oh, if they could but have the past three years to live over, they thought, how differently they would act. Hmm. If they could only see the Master again, how earnestly they would strive to show him how deeply lived that they loved him, and how sincerely they sorrowed for having ever grieved him by a word or an act of unbelief. But they were comforted by the thought that they were forgiven, and they determined that, so far as possible, they would atone for their unbelief by bravely confessing him before the world. Putting away all differences, all desire for the supremacy, 
They came close together in Christian fellowship. Ellen G. White, The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 36. Wow. Putting away all differences, all desire for the supremacy, they came close together in Christian fellowship. Do you think that could happen to a group in our day? Yes, by I do. By the grace of God. <laughs> Only by the Only grace of God. Only by the grace of God. Yeah. Well, if you just spent uh, a couple years at least in the companionship of Jesus, you should have learned something about that, right? And then I think that the 40 days before he ascended, they were rearranging their paradigm some, and yeah. then in the, those 10 days after he left, mm -hmm. they realized they, it they was did some more thinking, a lot time, more thinking. Yeah. Well, Pentecost, occurring 50 days after Passover, and thus named Pentecost, which means 50th, was, a, and that's of course in Greek, the Greek language, was the second major festival of the Jewish spiritual year. Did the disciples have any idea was, what was going to happen that day? What do you think? He told them, wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes. Yeah. So that's what they we don't look. Yeah, we don't have record that he said that it would be on pa uh, Pentecost. You know, I don't know if they knew or they suspected or if they had they no may, idea. Yeah, they may have, you know, speculated that that might be the day. But no. well, they were gathered together in Jerusalem in <clears throat> preparation. The forty days since Passover, followed by those ten days of preparation, left them all together and of one accord and in one place. Acts 2 verse 1. Pentecost was a celebration of the first fruits of the season. The barley which came up first was ready to be harvested. And thus it was time, it was a time of great celebration. Based on Exodus 19, 1, it is possible that they had begun also to celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai at the time of Pentecost. So why would Pentecost be a celebration of the time of the giving of the law? They were about 50 days from their exodus from Egypt to the giving of the, of the law at Sinai. So if Passover is the time to leave Egypt, then Pentecost would be the time of Mount Sinai, right? We do not know exactly how the events of Pentecost worked out, but apparently, trying to put the evidence together as far as I can do it, the disciples and other believers were gathered probably in the upper room. At the beginning, there was a sound of a mighty wind filling the house where they were sitting and bringing down on each of them tongues of fire, filling them with the Holy Spirit. Now, why did I say that? Well, first of all, we know that by the time they're done here, there's 3,000 people who want to be baptized. There's no possible place in Jerusalem in those days that could have maybe the race, horse racing track, I don't know, but no, no ordinary place that you could have brought 3,000 people except the temple courtyard. So it, we, we've got some kind of movement going on here. Uh, they began to speak in other tongues the words that God gave them, Acts 2, verses 2 to 4. Do we know how many were involved in that outpouring? Was it just the 12 disciples, or might it have included some of the 120 followers mentioned earlier? Were there any women, ladies, speak up, who received the outpouring at that time? And what about other occasions when the Spirit was poured out, such as Acts 8, verse 7, poured out on the Samaritans, Acts 10, 46, 44 to 46, it was poured out on the Cornelius and his family. Acts 11, 17, and 15, 8, it was poured out on a group in Ephesus. And Paul talks about it, in, I'm sorry, Acts 11 and, and 15, 8, where, they talk, he would, where he talks about what had happened with Cornelius and his family. Then it's Acts 19, verse 6, where it happened in Ephesus. So this wasn't an isolated occurrence. In Acts 2.1, it says, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from the sky. So it suggests it's much more than just the 12. Yes. Um, and, but the question is, all the believers, is that we, we said we, we think it's more than the 12, is it the 120? Because pretty soon that's there's going to be... That's the implication. Pretty soon there's going to be thousands, right? 
But that the thousands is after the yeah. outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Well, apparently, shortly after this, they after these tongues of fire had been falling down, they, they they moved to the temple courtyard. And what happened next was amazing. Uh, look at Acts two verses five through thirteen. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, religious people who had come from every country in the world. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered. So, you know, this almost sounds like the wind, the noise, and all that kind of stuff happened in the temple courtyard. But it, it, the other place it says in the, like it happened in the house. Maybe it continued, I don't know. They were all excited because one of uh, each one of them heard the believer speaking in his or her own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, these people who are talking like this are Galileans. How is it then that all of us hear them speaking in our own native languages? We hear from Parthia, Media, Elam, from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, A and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, from Egypt and the regions of Libya near Cyrene. Some of us are from Rome, by the way, were these the ones who later started the church in Rome? Possibly. Both Jews and Gentiles converted to Judaism, and some of us are from Crete and Arabia. Yet all of us hear them speaking in our own languages about the great things that God has done. I used to have a friend, uh, an Arab friend, who's passed on now, who grabbed on that. He just loved that verse. He says, Jesus, or I'm mean, sorry, not Jesus, but the disciples were speaking my language. He was very proud of that. Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? But others made fun of the believers, saying, these, these, these people are drunk. So, does that sound likely to you? Not really. Drunk people don't speak That's right. new languages and Cogent. make sense of it. Cogent new languages. And also many of them preaching were uneducated people also. And they seem to speak with wisdom and power. Mm. So it was amazing. Very, yeah. Well, let's think about the context here now. Certainly, the harvey, the barley harvest, would be a time for for joyous celebration, and that's what it's called. Do you remember the story of Babel, recorded in Genesis 11, at which time the languages of humanity were confused by the Lord, causing the people to scatter across the earth? Well, at Pentecost, he fixed that problem a bit. He re repaired it, giving the disciples the ability to speak fluently the languages of any peoples that they came in contact with in spreading the gospel. As usual, Peter took a leading role in those, those events. He stood up and began to preach. As a result of that sermon, 3,000 people chose to become followers of Christ and showed their commitment by being baptized. We have no idea where those baptisms took place. So There's did they all go through, apparently they didn't go through months and months of Bible study? Well, and so let's, let's so talk on. about that for a minute. These people were here for Pentecost. What does that imply? They were Jews. They were Jews or converts to Judaism. They were familiar with many of the Jewish beliefs, probably most of the Jewish beliefs pretty well already. You didn't have to preach about the Sabbath. You didn't have to... So, what, 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 what did they get excited about? What were they excited about? Jesus' ministry and the Holy Spirit. They wanted to hear more about Jesus and everything that happened in his life and what this was all about. You know, these 3,000 that are converted because Peter is preaching, those are all from the different countries. Presumably. So are they hearing in their own language or is Peter yes. repeating in several they're, languages. They're, they're hearing in their own languages. The gift of ears. The gift of ears. <laughs> yes. Dennis, I think you've got some words on that. Acts 2, 42 to 47. Yes. They spent their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship and sharing in the fellowship meals and the prayers. Many miracles and wonders were being done through the apostles, and everyone was filled with awe. All the believers continued together in close fellowship and shared their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions and distribute the money among all according to what each one needed. 
Day after day, they met as a group in the temple and they had their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Every day, the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. Good News Bible. I have two questions about that passage. The first one is, who had the right to decide what your needs were and what your needs were and what your needs were? Or, or were they just allowed freedom? Come on, help yourself, whatever you think you need. Well, Anybody have question. divine yeah. insight? As they're no. spending all this time together with each other, the, some of those things might become known just through yeah. talk, uh, you know, uh, amongst themselves. You know, this is... And, okay, the second question is what what is implied by enjoying the goodwill of all the people? Nobody was ha harassing them, yeah. apparently, at this time. Okay, let's just assume that that's correct. Where were they meeting most of the time? Temple courtyard and in homes. And who's in charge of the temple courtyard? Sad Sadducees. Especially the, the Sadducees. Yeah. And were they happy about what was going on there? Probably not, but something great had happened and maybe they felt they needed to hold back a bit, like um, who is the, the teacher, Paul's teacher? Gamaliel? Gamaliel had suggested they should. That came later. Wasn't yet. Oh, that's right. It did come later. Yeah. Well, if you found yourself among that, let's just suppose that you're one of those people who showed up here from what we today we would call Turkey. A number of those groups came from Cappadocia, Asia. Those were places in what we would now call Turkey. And you had, you had traveled to Jerusalem, maybe for your first time, to go through some Jewish ceremonies and confirm your Judaism. And now all of a sudden you hear about the exciting new, these exciting new in this new information, potentially that the Messiah himself has actually shown up, what would you do? What would you want to do? Learn more. Yeah. You'd want to know everything. At least I would. You want to know, okay, well, tell me more. What, what, where did this guy come from? What, what did he do? Let's hear all about it. So what do you think was happening during that time? A lot of Educating. A lot of educating going on. I'm sure that the disciples who had spent time with Jesus, and remember that the person who took the place of Judas was chosen from among those who had spent time with Jesus from the beginning. So there must have been a lot of other people who had spent a lot of time following Jesus, including the women. And all the new converts didn't need to be uh, from the, uh, all these other areas. There were certainly those there, but it, Peter seems to uh, target the fact that you crucified him. Some of those might have been involved, but there may have been just some of the others who uh, were part of that, that mob that, that actually lived in Jerusalem yeah. and participated, and so they might have a little more because uh, they were eyewitnesses to it. And certainly uh, at the time of the Jerusalem conference in 50 AD or so, there were many Pharisees and Sadducees among the believers. Yes. And ladies, for your benefit and for my benefit, whenever there is a possibility of talking about women, I like to turn to Luke chapter 8, the first three verses. And usually we think, okay, this is back. Jesus is with them on the earth. They're traveling around, probably moving around Galilee, maybe over into Perea on the other side of the Jordan, maybe even as far as down in Judea. And this is what it says. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The 12 disciples went with him. And that's, that's it, right? That's what happened? Well, and so did some women who had been healed of evil diseases and e evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons have been driven out, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, 
and Susanna and many, many other women who use their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. Hmm. And then also in Acts 1 verse 14, after in the previous verse listing the, the 12 or yeah. the disciples, it says, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women mm -hmm. and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So they would have been so in that group. The question is, did anybody discuss the fact that Jesus had been traveling around all his time with his group of men, along with the former prostitutes and demon-possessed women and high society women and so forth like that? Did that, that bother anybody? I would think it would be odd. <laughs> you think it would be odd, okay. Source of rumors. Yeah. So okay. Answering one of your prior questions, you said, what were the disciples teaching people? Mm -hmm. I suspect that they were, by that time, they'd kind of almost formulated the gospel story, the review of Jesus, you know, what later became the gospels. Yeah, I think they probably were thinking, well, yeah, okay, we did this, and then we did that, and yeah, and that, and remember this, remember that, remember this, da 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 da, da. Yeah, I, I, I suspect, yeah, they had... They probably had it nailed down in their minds after, you know, after. E even though the Gospels themselves weren't written until many years many later. Many years later. Yeah. So since that was the time of Pentecost, we must assume that all those who were there at that point were Jews or had some Jewish background. Did they need to be taught about the Sabbath, for example? Probably not. Or about the traditional teachings of the Old Testament? Uh, probably not. But now the hope of the Jewish nation for 2,000 years had come and lived his life, and they wanted to hear about every detail. I mean, think about something that your group of people had been looking forward to for at least 1,500 years, and someone says, he's here, and you would say, where, 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 where? I mean, I, I, wouldn't you? And actually they would say, he's been here. He's, he's left. Here. And this, at this point in time, you'd say he's been here. Oh, no. They spent time in prayer, learning and breaking of bread together, Acts 2, verse 46. It seems clear that after having sessions of learning in the temple courtyard, they scattered to private homes where they shared meals together. They developed a very close bond of fellowship among them. I don't know if any of you have had the privilege of, of going to a, to a conference somewhere of Adventists, where you're quite a ways away, maybe in a, in a nice secluded area where you're not distracted by other things going on, and someone's there, maybe two, three people are there giving a presentations, and this is a chance just to fellowship and think and study and, and, and understand what the group has come to teach, and it's just a marvelous time for fellowship. I've had the privilege of being with a few of those things, and those are, those are precious memories. And that's what they were doing. But where was this place where they were spending most of their time? Still the temple courtyard. The temple courtyard. And, and the temple courtyard, what do we know about that? Sorry, I don't have my picture here, but that was a large open area uh, around the temple complex itself. And what was it used for? It was a marketplace to sell... What was it? Animals that would be sacrifices. What was it supposed to be used for? For teaching the Gentiles. It was supposed to be the court, courtyard, excuse me, of the Gentiles, where they could come in and observe how the Jews were worshiping and, and, and learn about the Jewish religion. But it was being used as a, as a stock market, <clears throat> literally stock market, not Wall Street, but it, was, but it was also a place for money changers and things like that, because you had to... If you were a good Jew, you had to pay your shekel, uh, was half shekel fee, all the men had to, once a year to support the temple. Well, and all this was happening right under the noses of the priests, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. And they were very happy about it, because it says they had the full appreciation of all the people, right? Gordon, you want to read to us about that? From Acts of the Apostles. The priests and rulers were greatly enraged at this wonderful manifestation, but they dared not give way 
to their malice for fear of exposing themselves to the violence of the people. They had put the Nazarene to death, but here were his servants, unlettered men of Galilee, telling in all the languages then spoken the story of his life and ministry. The priests, determined to account for the miraculous power of the disciples in some natural way, declared that they were drunken from partaking largely of the new wine prepared for the feast. Okay, what's the new wine? That's fresh grape juice. Yeah. You were drunk hey, from fresh grape juice? Did you ever get drunk on that? It's wonderful stuff, but <laughs> you don't get drunk on it. <clears throat> Go ahead, sorry. Some of the most ignorant of the people <clears throat> who were present seized upon the, the suggestion as the truth, but the more intelligent knew it to be false, and those who understood the different languages testified to the accuracy with which these languages were used by the disciples. Okay, Acts of the Apostles, page 40, paragraph 2. Well, as local Sabbath school classes, and this is a Sabbath school class, or even local churches, uh, what could we learn from these experiences? Did God intend for, is this just a story we tell, or did God intend to, to learn something very specifically, or several things maybe very specifically from that experience? I think it's important to listen to people's stories that they have to tell, how God has worked in their lives, their troubles and trials, whatever it is, and to tell your story to them. Mm -hmm. And that isn't always done in just a quick and easy fix. You have to set aside a time and a place to do those sort of things. And our homes are really the best place for that kind of thing to happen. Yeah. Well, Acts 2.44. Go ahead. Or pot, what? Yes, potluck after Sabbath school. Yes, exactly. Acts 2, 44 and 45 says, All the believers continued together in close fellowship and shared their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions and distribute the money among all according to what each one needed. Boy, this is real fellowship, right? So was this outpouring of goodwill and financial support occasioned by the fact that some of the new believers were very poor? Possibly. They're, they they wanted to mo move from wherever it was and stay there, and they didn't. Uh, it's not like you could go down to an ATM. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or call up your real estate agent and sell your house back home or something. Yeah, so, right. So they may have been sort of a uh, short-term kind of needs that people needed to, so to live and. Do you think there was any special thing that motivated people to sell their property and give the money to the apostles? Love. What? Love, okay. The incentive that Jesus is going to come back real soon. I'm pretty sure the, the speech was, we don't need these, this extra property anymore, we don't need this extra money now because Jesus promised that he's coming back very soon. So they were expecting it within weeks? Possibly months, not years. But they wouldn't have sold. Uh, everybody didn't sell everything. No, Because no. obviously there was this house that Peter went to where they were praying and knocks on the door, you know. Yeah. And there had to be places, houses where they met for the food and things. But this was kind of the extra stuff. Yeah. Some have suggested in our day that unless you're willing to share everything you have in a kind of communal way, you can't experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and experience those Pentecostal-like blessings. Is that true? That's not the way it happened here. No? The Spirit has to come first yep. and fill all of us, mm -hmm. and then it happens. The Otherwise, that, it's kind of a legal exchange. It's, it, yeah. yeah. Legalistic exchange. The thing that I get out of all of this is how what they were hearing there was in their own tongue. It kind of puts the light of what we hear on some of the religious channels today, doesn't it? You mean those languages aren't your tongue? Nothing that I recognize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the important contributors to this early process was Barnabas, and we read about that in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. 
The group of believers was one in mind and heart. None of them said that any of their belongings were their own, but they all shared with one another everything they had. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God poured rich blessings on them all. There was no one in the group who was in need. Those who owned fields or houses would sell them, bring the money received from the sale, and hand it over to the apostles. And the money was distributed to each one according to his need. So we keep running at that according to his need business. And so it was that Joseph, a Levite born in Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means one who encourages, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and handed, over to, handed it over to the apostles. So there's a very clear example from somebody that we've come to know. Do we think this is the same Barnabas as Paul and Barnabas later? It is. Missionary journey, journeys? He's Barnabas, he's from the same place. Yeah, there's very good reason to believe it is the same person. He apparently had moved to Jerusalem for whatever reason. Uh, what do you think inspired him to sell that piece of property and give the money to the disciples, to the apostles? The stories he'd been hearing about Christ and what yeah. Christ did for others. Again, that was probably his retirement policy for five years from now. He didn't need it if Jesus was coming back in a few months. Very likely. Well, unfortunately, not everybody was 100% with it. And we read a story of Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, I don't have time to read that whole passage right now, but you remember that they had a piece of property They said, we would like to give this. We'll sell it and we'll give the money to, to, the, to the cause. And when they sold it, they got more for it than they expected. And so they said, well, maybe if we just keep some of this money, we'll have a little in store over here and we'll, we'll give the rest of it to the apostles. And uh, Ananias walked in, presumably with his money, and said, here's the money. And Peter said, is that the correct amount? Yeah. Why are you trying to lie to the Holy Spirit? And he fell over dead. Three hours later, his wife walks in. Oh, did you sell that property for this certain amount? Yeah, we did. Why did you try to lie to the Holy Spirit? Clunk. What happened there? We really don't, apart from their death, we really don't know. The Holy Spirit is required for every breath, every pulse beat, every metabolic process. If the Holy Spirit withdraws his support, you die. Okay, so God just withdrew his support, or did they have, maybe some have suggested they so shocked that they had heart attacks. Although there's no evidence that people in those days had heart attacks. Were they so controlled by the devil that God said, okay, Satan, go ahead, you can kill them? Well, Satan goes oh. around like a roaring lion, seeking yeah. who he may devour, so if God's well, not sustaining you, what, what's going to need to happen to you? So let's think about this for a moment. If you were God, what would you have done right at that point? Well, I think eventually there lies would have that would have been found out anyway so uh, i don't think god had to do anything uh, it just happened that, that way and probably a fair number of people says thought well god's killing you well that may be a stretch but uh <laughs> i don't think god well, needs to kill anybody to get their attention that, that's if, that's extortion uh, mm -hmm. duress coercion well, if they had kept it back and God had sort of winked at it, and then someone found out that, uh, and certainly with, people would have found out with that kind of a communal living situation, sure. they would have found out that they had not given the whole amount of money, then what would have happened? Well, the people would have had to make a decision who's going to stay in their group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were going to say, well, you know, you don't have to be completely honest with God, right? Well, He's not going to do anything. There's probably even worse things have happened down through the, through the centuries, and we're talking about close to 20 centuries since that incident. So uh, I think even more egregious things than, than a guy still holding some money back is happening. Yeah. And what do we see with these 
the, the, the Catholic Church for all the stuff that they've been doing here, and they, it keeps coming out, and yet pe people still subscribe to that uh, pagan philosophy that they're peddling. Well, I, think, no, go ahead. I think that they made a grievous mistake in thinking that they could lie, that it was the same to lie to you, because you won't know any better. Um, but to lie to God? Oh, God's, God's not caught by surprise. No, but they thought they well, could lie to but, God. Well, and, and, and this, there was a consequence to their action. And there, like, that's right. To uh, have fear before God is actually wisdom, because He is God. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a great, uh, there was something wrong with Ananias and Sapphira that they thought that was okay. Because oh, they didn't have to sell it. They didn't have to sell it. They didn't have to give right. any of it. Exactly. <clears throat> but yeah. to lie about it, it well, was would that ickier. Would that event scare everybody? Well, the last verse, Acts 5.11 says, the whole church and all the others who heard of this were terrified. Well, now, didn't we have an excuse for why Satan didn't get killed when, when he... Um, transgressed and everybody knew he did mm -hmm. yeah. because everybody would be scared of God after that. Mm -hmm. Looks like it just happened here. Does God? So how do you put those two together? Is God's message of love and, and truth so impotent that he has to intimidate, to persuade? This, this I don't think any, so. Well, 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 it happened though. It what were they ha but it, did God do it? That's, a, that's what well, we're That arguing. doesn't matter. That doesn't really matter because they were terrified. It doesn't matter. God could have done it. It still would have had the same effect. Why? They would have been terrified. Once again. They were already that's, terrified. We that, got that's a part of the story. That's, we can read that text. Yeah, but you're not, you're not seeing the point there that, that it just happened. But I mean. One of the points here, let me just jump okay. in here. They were, were terrified. What kind of voice is that in English language? Passive, Passive voice, which means that it, whoever did it is anonymous. Right. It doesn't tell us who did it. Right. What? This, oh, oh, they were what terrified. Mean. It doesn't they tell were, us who I caused it. you said were as in they were terrified for a while, but then afterwards no, no. it became no. hat. They were tense. terrified. It, it's, it's, it's passive voice, which means we don't know who did it. Yeah, God's not taking any blame for it or credit, yeah. and uh, that I mean, all it is is a story. That. that doesn't make sense to me. Well, it says they were terrified. It they doesn't, were it doesn't terrified. say Gary did it. It doesn't say Ken Look did it. Look at grammar. Just just take grammar for that's a minute. They were that's terrified. That's that's all that's it says. You're that's reading that's a bunch of stuff that's into that's it. What, that's what he's doing. It's the grammatical approach to it. We don't know, know. whether they were wealthy whether they were rich or whether they had royal blood or anything. They were terrified. It doesn't yeah. matter. It does say that. That is a fact. They yeah. were no, terrified. We're agreeing with that. We're just okay. saying, we're just saying the, 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 the passage doesn't tell us who caused it. Right. It just doesn't tell us. Well, well, how does were tell you that they didn't know? Because it, it tells me that they voice. were terrified. That means you're, the subject is terrified. They were terrified. They they are the subject. No, the terrified the is no, the object. No, 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 no. And that's that's yeah. what all you're saying we, there. That's that's just we, we grammar, have a basic in grammar. English somewhere else. Let, let me. <laughs> no, let me, I mean. Let me try to say something. <laughs> you I, I you got to interpret it somehow. Well, that's what he's done. I, mean, I know he has, but I'm just interpreting it safely. And yeah. saying that, look at the, the grammar of the thing. Get a good dictionary and you'll see what he's driving at. Yeah. No, I don't be know. A good big dictionary uh, that really has it in it. Yeah. Dennis. Yeah, yeah. Dennis. so uh, apparently uh, Ananias and Sapphira were approaching this from a natural, uh, you know, that the church, there was a certain amount of naturalness about that because they were ignoring the fact that God would know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. So when the, this special thing, and we're not going to debate what happened, uh, who did it or what, but suddenly the, these po both these people oh. died, it became something very special. It would be like when somebody, an angel, appears to you, mm -hmm. uh, and you, you, this, you can see this as a supernatural being, 
you are terrified and they say fear not you know in that situation I don't see any fear not here it just says no, no, they were no, terrified I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to clarify that in those situations they would say fear clearly not. what here, happened here they fear not understand what happened couldn't you say that this How was the devil's attempt to upset the apple cart? They had absolutely. They had something that was obviously highly organized. It had to have been mm -hmm. somewhere. The devil's going to put his nose through any the fence, way he and possibly. That's what he did. Any way he possibly can. So the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira were either caused by God or God allowed it. Yeah, we know that. The argument there. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're. we're so we just want to yeah. make sure that everyone realizes that. Okay, so, and we know that on two later occasions, uh, m one time from Antioch and later from, from Macedonia and Achaia, big offerings were collected and taken to the, to the people in Jerusalem. So they were in recipients of wonderful blessings on, financial blessings on several occasions. Um, and Paul, remember, says, well, these Jewish people passed out their spiritual blessings and so now, it's time for us to help them by giving them our, our financial blessings, our, our material blessings. Well, many church members in our day are relatively poor. Those who live in fairly affluent countries of the world today make up about 10% of the Adventist church membership, about 10%. Most of the rest of Adventism are relatively poor. I can tell you of countries I visited recently where the monthly wage is $30, 30 US dollars for a month's labor, okay? This is especially two and third world countries we're talking about, but Paul speaking on God's behalf said that God will care for those who give generously, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 to 15. Does that apply to the poor people as well? Does God expect them to give generously? Did it apply to the widow's might? Yeah, what about that widow who gave everything? Yeah. yeah. I wish we had a story. Well, someday I'm going to ask Jesus, okay, I want to hear the rest of that story. What happened with that lady? Yeah. Did she go marry a rich guy or, you know, what happened? <laughs> she might be at heaven. You can ask her. I'm hoping so. I hope I'll be there. Their benevolence testified that they had not received the grace of God in vain. What could produce such liberality but the sanctification of the Spirit? In the eyes of believers and unbelievers, it was a miracle of grace. I'm sorry, that was supposed to be... That was your oh. pa passage. I, did you I, read mine? You I, did. Just by accidentally, I oh, did. Oh, that's all right. Jim? That was from Acts of the Apostles, yes. page 344. Yes. Sorry. I didn't realize I was reading the right. passage there. The blue one is yours. Ready? Mm -hmm. This liberality of the part, on the part of the believers in Acts 2, 44 and 45, and Acts 4, 32 to 35, was the result of the outpouring of the Spirit. The converts to the gospel were of one heart and of one soul. Once common interest controlled them, the success of the mission entrusted to them, and covetousness had no place in their lives. Their love for their brethren and the cause they had espoused was greater than their love of money and possessions. Their works testified that they accounted the souls of men of higher value than earthly wealth. Thus it has excuse me, thus it will ever be when the Spirit of God takes possession of the life. Those whose hearts are filled with the love of Christ will follow the example of him who for our sake became poor though through his poverty we might be made rich. Money, time, influence, all the gifts that they have received from God's hand, they will value only as a means of advancing the work of the gospel. Thus, it will seem in the early church, excuse me, thus it was in the early church and when the church today, it is seen that the power of the Spirit, the members have taken their affections from the things of the world and that they are willing to make sacrifices in order that their fellow men may hear the gospel and truths proclaimed will have a powerful influence upon the hearers. Ellen G. White, Acts of the Apostles, page 70. So what kinds of things can we do in our churches today to promote fellowship, joint worship, and generosity? 
Would there be times when it would be appropriate for us to try to promote fellowship with members of other church groups as well? What about non-Christian groups? But well, we need to have, know what the message is. Yeah. I mean, the, the, Jesus was the messenger as well as the message. And if people are off onto some tangent, mm -hmm. but don't, you know, you, we can't force them to, th to think. So. Yeah. Well, what beliefs, practices, and common values do you think were discussed earnestly among those first members who joined the Church of Pentecost? What did they think had happened to them? Well, Jesus. Yeah. Was a, was in common. Think about that experience again. I'm not going to reread because we don't have time. Acts 2, 42 to 47. Listen at the activities hap that happened. They, were, they would share meals in homes. They would worship together in the temple courtyard. They received the Holy Spirit uh, among them. We don't know how many received the Holy Spirit, but some clearly received the Holy Spirit. They, they, they were rejoicing of, of this. People were baptized. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that happened. Uh, think of what a church today would, how exciting it would be if that kind of stuff was going on in a church today. What, what would be the difference between Christian fellowship and socializing with friends? What kind of things might prevent us in our day from having experiences like these ones we're reading about here? Many churches find that there are reasons why they are not comfortable engaging in that kind of Christian fellowship. What things divide us in our churches today? Just thinking about that. Protestants, especially in America, began to think about the prophecies in the Bible as a result of recognizing that Lisbon earthquake, the, day, the dark day, the Pope being taken captive in 1798, and that's what led up to the original uh, Great Awakening and, and, and eventually to the um, Great Disappointment. Many of the disciples were fishermen, and you know all about that. So. What can we learn of the, of the things? One of the interesting comments described by the early disciples was that they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. Do we do that? Continually devote ourselves to the disciple, to the Christian teachings from the disciples? Could that happen to someone today? Could that happen to us? Is, is that why we have programs like this one? Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to discuss together these passages of Scripture that have so many implications. May we come to understand them better. May we, as a result of our time together here, uh, represent you well is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.